Hello and welcome to the Sandpit Startups podcast, where we explore entrepreneurship and journey into the minds of the brightest and the best founders this region has to offer. We're here to build a connection between the entrepreneurs in the studio and the entrepreneurs listening at home. Hopefully the next half an hour educates, motivates, or inspires you. And if it does, you know where the follow button is. Today, we are thrilled to have with us Christian Mischler, who is a serial and global entrepreneur who has co-founded wildly successful startups such as Food Panda, Hotel Quickly, Guess Ready, and most recently, Deskimo, where I had the privilege to, to work with him. Chris is an inspiring personality who has not only built and scaled various startups globally, but is also part of the world of venture capital and brings a unique perspective to the startup ecosystem. Thank you so much, Chris, for uh, making the time to, and to be here. Well, thanks for having me. Well, to kickstart about entrepreneurship mainly, usually they say that entrepreneurship is an acquired skill. And, uh, but I do believe that the entrepreneurial DNA resides in everybody. For example, at the age of 16, where I was busy trying to figure out calculus and my life goals, Chris here had uh, his first venture then. Could you share more about, about that, please? Sure. Yeah, so uh, I was in high school, and uh, it was in the dot-com years, so that gives away uh, a little bit how old I am. Um, but so, uh, you know, together with a friend of mine, uh, we decided to start a web design business, and it was in 98, in and um, we didn't really know what we're doing, but uh, all the companies like small SMEs in Switzerland, where I was, uh, was born and grew up, they felt like they need a website uh, for whatever reason ever and you know we had the skills to kind of like you know design websites and, and put them live and put them onto some uh, hosting providers and we totally overcharged our clients and <laughs> we created something uh, you know while being high school students and, and it defines our high school uh, which was great um the company you know survived for a number of years uh, we then had to pivot from like web design into hosting and to voice over ip but you know, it was, um, you know, we kind of like ran behind kind of like the trends and so like what is coming and and we just had like sort of an easy way to make some money. It was not really, um, you know, it was a cash cow for us, right? So it was a lifestyle business mm -hmm. in a way. And but while being a high school, high school student, uh, this, this was very good. Wow. Well, I know I know some people at school that were selling like sweets, you know, at lunchtime, <laughs> but that's having really something quite stand. different. <laughs> Sorry. And probably having a lemonade stand in the early days, but yeah, this is something next level. <laughs> yeah, this is really different. <laughs> um, Probably fast forwarding a few years into the exciting times uh, where you co-founded uh, Food Panda, uh, I believe you you scaled the venture of to 28 countries within within 12 months. So if you could take us back to those early days and to share how you achieved that hyper growth and perhaps uh, the learnings that you had there. Sure. Yeah. So I I joined Food Panda in 2012, and Food Panda was a rocket internet venture, and and rocket is. As you're probably familiar with, it's, a, it's this large term business incubator that is not the most creative, um, but they're very good in kind of like copying successful models and bringing them to new geographies. And so I was, you know, at the time I was working for Credit Suisse, uh, in-house consulting, and I was approached uh, by Rocket Internet and they offered me basically to become a co-founder of this food delivery business in Asia. And... Uh, I was like, you know, sounds exciting because, mm -hmm. you know, I had another company after that web design company that I just shared and, and I actually wanted to go back into entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So it was great, you know, to have given, you know, been given this opportunity by Rocket Internet. And I was like, okay, you know, I can take a chance and, and just like try and see where this would take me. If it doesn't work out, you know, I can always go back to Credit Suisse. It's much cheaper to hire me back than, than to hire a new, uh, you know, right. consultant. Right. And so, uh, you know, I quit uh, Credit Suisse and moved to Asia. I could pick one out of five countries that Rocket offered me. So I chose Thailand. Um, after three months, I was moved to Singapore. So I was one of the three co-founders of Food Panda. Mm -hmm. I was global COO. And, and um, the task was basically just copy seamless, grab up, just eat. You know, okay. don't be creative. You know, just copy whatever like works for these guys. And develop a website that looks and feels similar but but has a bit of you know a different branding um, we had actually surveys where we asked people about the brand you know what what brand they like so you know people liked food panda most so we went with food panda and so i had my uh, my it team in portugal and they just had like these three websites open that seamless crop up just eat open mm -hmm. and just went through like sort of okay what's the user onboarding you know what what kind of information do they ask how do they do the restaurants listing how do they present the menus and 
And so, you know, we weren't very creative in, in that way uh, in terms of like reinventing the wheel, but, but we just took something that was successful in, in a different geography and we brought it to Southeast Asia. And so we started in five countries in Southeast Asia first. Um, it was first English only. Very quickly we, okay. we needed to, uh, to localize, localize then yeah. because, you know, we just realized that, you know, in Thailand, Indonesia particularly, if you just go with English, then it's really, really hard. The expat community is too small to really build, build a business. And we had very aggressive um, you know, growth numbers given to us by Rocket Internet. So they had basically the growth plan, the business plan, and it just went like you know, parabolic up. And you know, we, <laughs> we had no product, no operations, no customer service, like nothing was in place. No, you know, no customers. Like we had to kind of like introduce this concept of food delivery to the region because there were hardly any professional food delivery companies. And so it, it took a lot of efforts to educate the market, educate the customers, like build this whole mm -hmm. kind of like machine. Even though it was a template, but we still had to build this machine. Yeah. And so, you know, we started um, very kind of like hands-on, you know, we just hired right. like random people. Um, we worked out of a co-working space, but then, you know, we, we realized, okay, we need to accelerate. So in order to hit our growth targets, you know, we had to expand, we had to hire more people. So we hired 500 people, you know, within 12 months. We expanded, as I said, like mm -hmm. to 28 countries. Um, I was, you know, line manager of the team in in Thailand, Vietnam, in I'm an IT team in Portugal, the team in Colombia, Incredible. like the other side of the world, like, you know, I was traveling all the time. And, and so we've built this company very quickly. We were just, you know, given kind of like a budget by Rocket and said, like, okay, you know, here's the budget, here's the template. And, you know, here are your two co-founders in a way. <laughs> now <laughs> you guys, uh, you off work. you go. And, <laughs> and if you don't uh, perform or deliver, then, you know, there's going to be other consultants waiting that we hire out of BCG or McKinsey or wherever, and, and they're going to take your spot. Pressure so we had a you know, personal pressure on uh, us <laughs> to really yeah. be able to deliver, right? Wow. I just wanted to take a quick step back. There's something really interesting you said, which was like, you will jump out of your job and actually it will be cheaper just to get hired back. That's a really interesting mentality because I know there's a lot of people out there that have a really secure job and they have a startup in mind that they want to pursue, but they think it's too much of a risk to leave a job. Mm. But you just brushed over it like... Yeah, yeah, they'll hire me back, no problem. <laughs> yeah. What would you say to them to maybe just give them that little bit of motivation to to pursue what they what they're passionate about? And there's two things to it. Like, like a when you're in a salaried job, you know, then it's uncomfortable to think of, okay, I leave this job and the kind of like this, you know, the safe security that comes with it, like with the salary income, and I don't know kind of like how to pay my bills in a few months down the road if, you, if I don't have like sort of income from any secured source. And so it, it feels kind of like it's a big step to take. Um, normally when you take this step and you look back, you realize, okay, it was actually not that bad because, it, you know, it's, you know, maybe you need to adjust your lifestyle a little bit or, you know, maybe you had some like golden handcuffs and you had like a, a spending behavior that you need mm -hmm. to adjust a little bit. But, you know, making that change, it feels much bigger before you take the step than after you know, ha having taken that step and looking back onto it. But the thing was also with Credit Suisse in-house consulting, they were very selective and that was part of the recruiting process. There was like, you know, for candidates, we had one, like every month there was like a recruiting day and there were seven interviews, four in the morning, three in the afternoon, each one hour. And if not the first four in the morning said yes to a candidate, the candidate basically was, was rejected at lunch already, so it didn't even have to attend the next three. And all seven had to say yes to a candidate in order for that candidate to, uh, to get an offer. So it was a very Stringent slow selection. and very expensive selection yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you have such a process, then you know, it's very expensive. And, and so it's much cheaper to, to hire somebody back who was already pre-qualified, was already there for a few years. Um, Rocket was the opposite. So Rocket yeah. basically says, like, look, you know, why do we have to do all of these expenses? If you hire 500 people in a year, we can't go through like this this type of recruiting process. So they basically just said like, you know, we just hire people that were pre-qualified. So we hire people that made it into you know, these type of jobs and they've been pre-selected by these companies that have all of these expensive recruiting uh, processes. And so it's much cheaper in a way for them to just hire them out of their jobs. And so for me, it was kind of like clear, okay, I could go back, you know, to Credit Suisse if I wanted to, if it doesn't work out, like after a few months, having spent in Thailand, a nice summer, a nice adventure, starting a food <laughs> delivery company in Asia. Um, you know, I could go back and, and work again for Credit Suisse because they were still recruiting and it would have been cheaper. So I think, you know, it's, it's on the one hand, like, you know, don't be afraid to take that step because it will probably feel like a smaller step once you've taken it than what it feels right now. And if you're in a good job and you went through like a recruiting process and, and you, you know, deliver against your targets in, in whatever you do, 
it's most likely that the employer will be happy, you know, take you back, um, you know, in, in normal circumstances at least. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You really just had like the logic behind it to say, yeah, it's fine. I have a parachute if I need to fall back. Mm, right. But thankfully you didn't and you've achieved really great stuff. So it was fun. Yeah. I mean, it was also like when I was in, uh, in Asia, like after a few months, uh, my previous manager at Credit Suisse reached out to me and said like, hey, um, you still haven't sent me your new address because I still have to send you my like sort of the, the letter of recommendation, right. et cetera. So for like your future job applications. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, hopefully and, you know, I'll never <laughs> have to <laughs> use that letter ever. Yeah. You know? so Did you tell him? <laughs> I told him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you were banking on yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I never <laughs> used it so far and I hope uh, I will never. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So over your time with Food Panda, you've raised a lot of money uh, while you were there. Well, it was it was a rocket venture, right? So mm -hmm. they basically, you know, uh, the thing is, when you're a co-founder with a rocket venture, it's actually it belongs to Rocket Internet. You get a okay. you know a little bit of shares in the company. I was lucky to be a global co-founder, global mm -hmm. CEO, so I got like global equity. But it's a it's a very minimal percentage, and it's okay. vested over four years. And mm -hmm. you know, normally have like a year cliff, etc. So you know, um, you usuals, you do get yeah. some shares, but. Uh -huh. But it's not your company. It's not like you know other companies where where you're really in the driver's seat, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, and so in that way it was actually more rocket internet raising mm -hmm. the money and and so like Oli Sumber and, and his two brothers you know they were I think in 2012 to raise two billion for their portfolio companies and there's like that's external crazy. capital that and that's during the early days of rocket internet yeah there was like the golden years like yeah. uh, your rocket <laughs> internet in 2012 2013 yeah that's great so I was going to ask about what kind of scrutiny you've stood up to when coming to the investors but perhaps maybe you got a bit shielded from rocket maybe yeah. they had to deal with that yeah a bit definitely more. but yeah. subsequently you started uh, a few other ventures for example hotel quickly mm. I I understand that usually. Uh, Startup ideas come from either a life experience or, or work experience, but I believe you were traveling around so much. So the idea of Hotel Quickly, was it incepted then during the travels and, and, and the journey of, of that startup? Yeah, absolutely. So I was, um, you know, for Rocket Internet, I was traveling so much mm -hmm. and I had a budget given to me, which was $100 per night for, for my hotel stays. Which you know, in Vietnam or Thailand is great, but yeah. Singapore, you know, you stay in a three-star hotel. You know, maybe if there's like a good deal, maybe in a four-star, mm -hmm. but most like three-star hotel. And so I came across Hotel Tonight in the U.S. and they had last-minute discounts through a mobile app. And I was like, wow, this is great because I always travel spontaneously. You know, always last minute. So you know, if this app was in Asia, then for my hundred dollars, I could actually stay in four-star hotels, maybe even five-star hotels. You know, if mm -hmm. if they have a really steep discount. And uh, they were only in the US, they were just, there was the, the Olympics in, in London, so they started to expand to the UK, but you know, very slowly, and Asia was not on the, on the horizon. And so like, wow, okay, but why not start this myself? Like, you know, in, in good rocket, uh, you know, uh, uh, terms, kind of like, you know, take something yeah. successful in another, another geography and, and proliferate basically that te technology and service to another country. And so um, I, was, I was calling up like a friend of mine uh, from back at university and, and pitched him the idea of Hotel Tonight in Asia. And um, it took a little bit of convincing, but then after a few weeks, I was like, okay, I'm going to ramp down everything in Europe. I'm going to move to Bangkok. I'm going to move in with you. I'm going to be okay. the co-founder and CEO. Amazing. And then I convinced uh, Raphael, who's yeah. now my co-founder at Eskimo, to also leave Food Panda. He was the MD of Food Panda in Vietnam, to also then join as a co-founder at Hotel Quickly. And, uh, and two more co-founders. And so we were uh, five co-founders. That then started the business in early 2013 and, and was basically a clone of Hotel Tonight, but mm -hmm. for the Asian markets, where we sold um, basically same day hotels with a steep discount. And it's Amazing. because hotels, you know, at, at 6, 7 p.m., they know, you know, will they still sell like another two, three, four rooms? Right. If they still have 20 rooms available, it's much better to sell them through an app and kind of like a private sale rather than keeping them empty because an empty room is the most expensive room. Right? And so um, it, it worked well. So, you know, we scaled the company then over the following four, four and a half years um, and then sold the company in 2017 uh, when it was in 16 countries uh, between Japan and New Zealand. So it covered all of Asia Pacific and, and was doing quite well. Fantastic. So then your question regarding raising investment, right? So as now it's, it's probably a different situation than it was with Rocket. So we're here, it was a new new experience of raising investment and I believe there was up to a series A round perhaps uh, for this. So as Sam was mentioning, the due diligence process of, of this, I believe growth is one of the factors. Mm. Uh, I understand uh, YC mentions that uh, growth is the best yardstick for product market fit. 
And is that the same thing that resonates with the founders and, and the investors while uh, pitching it to them? So it's it's very business dependent as well. Okay. Um, you know, some businesses they live off kind of like growth, user growth. Like if you're mm -hmm. if you have like a social network, like you know, if you had food, uh, Facebook back in the days, yeah. You know, they didn't monetize for like the first years and and didn't even know how to monetize. But but their growth was so you know immense that all the investors were like, yeah, okay, at some point we will be able to monetize this somehow. Right? And so it depends, you know, some fintechs, they play kind of like that as well. Like it's more about user growth rather than revenue growth. I think, um, you know, now reality caught up uh, with many of these type of ventures. But back then, um, it was still kind of like the gold rush in Asia. And, okay. and we played the card of former rocket internet executives, uh, you know, start a new business. It's kind of like, you know, the success of kind of like rocket internet. We kind of like, you know, kind of projected on ourselves mm -hmm. as like, you know, we were that success at Rocket Internet. And now, you know, you as an investor can join us on our kind of like next journey. And so to raise a seed round, it's all around kind of like the founders, the, right. the story, the vision that you paint, mm -hmm. like all of these kind of things. And and just convince kind of like investors, look, you know, this is your chance to get rich, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you should, you know, I'm the person you should bet on because I'm going to make you a lot of money. And and so. You know, it's a it's it's always a founder team investment on the like kind of pre seed right. stage. Series A, you know, it's more about kind of like product market fit, and then yeah, you need to start uh, to show traction. Okay. You know, does what you've kind of like promised during the seed round does does this you know work out? Uh, does the product see adoption? What's kind of like your customer acquisition cost? And then as you grow, more and more important are the unit economics, and mm -hmm. that's something that both at Foo Panda but also at Hotel Crypto particularly we have disregarded for too long. And so, you know, we had, we thought that quickly, it's a commission-based business. So we basically got a commission of the, the booking volume that, right. that we've uh, transacted. Yeah. And so the commission that we got on average per unit, we needed three bookings for to repay basically the customer acquisition costs that we mm -hmm. had. And in many cases, you know, people were like, oh, I need a hotel now. They Googled, they saw an ad, they downloaded the app, they made a booking, and then they didn't come back. And so we need to kind of like reactivate them because whenever they then thought of like, you know, making another booking, they're like, oh, booking.com or, or Expedia or Agoda oh, or whatever, yeah. you know, was kind of like top of their mind. And didn't think of like, oh, I downloaded this app and maybe, you know, I could wait until the last minute, but, you know, maybe there's no room available, but I could maybe save a little bit if something's still available. So they didn't want to take the risk of, you know, waiting until the last minute to make that booking. And so we had to kind of like reactivate people and give them more vouchers. And with mm -hmm. that, we continuously destroyed our unit economics. And, uh, and it was kind of like unprofitable on the unit level. And so that's that's a big risk uh, that you run when you're just after growth. Okay. You know, growth alone is not product market fit. Mm -hmm. you, know, you should have something that like builds something that, that people love. Right? It's, uh, you know, it's also uh, or what, what people want. You know, it's what, have what the YC says. Have the willingness to pay for it and yeah, it's, like, you know, it, yeah. it's really like a service that people are like, oh, this is great. And, and they want to use it again because it solves a real problem for them. And if it's just like about savings, it's it's really hard. Like if you're not profitable on the unit level in the first booking or the first transaction, it's going to be really hard to make this a sustainable business. And that's something that, you know, we didn't we didn't enforce enough. I'd say like mm -hmm. in both ventures in Food Panda, that's why many of them are still unprofitable to this day. Right. But then also hold that quickly, which uh, you know it it took way too long to kind of like not only grow the top line but then also the bottom line and sure. and reach more kind of like profitability. How how were you able to bring that acquisition and reacquisition cost down? Was that more of a, like a marketing effort, or was it more sort of like internally how the app may work? How did you approach that? Yeah, so it's often you need to find the right target audience. Like so, because it's a commission business. If you have a, a hotel room in Indonesia mm -hmm. that costs twenty dollars, and you get even again you get like twenty five percent commission. It's so minimal, you know, that it's it's hardly worth it. Though you know when you focus on say Singapore. Where the hotel room <coughs> is maybe two hundred dollars, then it's a it's a lot higher commission, so you can yeah. invest more into customer acquisition costs. But then you're up against the likes of Booking Holdings and Expedia, and they have very deep pockets, you know. So you also need to find kind of like the niche keywords that it can bid on. Um, that's why we had an app because we felt mm -hmm. like when you have an app, you have kind of like that real estate on people's phones, yes. and so it's easier to also send them like a push notification to reactivate them, so it doesn't cost you that much. And in Asia, people are more willing to download apps than, say, in the West. Like in Europe, particularly now, like it's it's very hard to actually convince somebody to download a new app because everyone's kind of like you know bored of like downloading apps. Like I have all the apps that I need. Why do I have to download another app? 
And so now it's actually better to have a web app, um, mm -hmm. in Europe at least, but in Asia people are still, you know, happy to download apps. They delete them again, and, but, but still, you know, they're okay to trial. And so, you know, you can, you can play around a little bit with like the product itself, you know, app versus web, uh, the targeting, you know, web, you know, the segment basically of people, and then you try to find lookalikes of that audience that you're serving, and you try to find more people that have the same kind of like um, attributes in terms of their spending behavior, the travel behavior, um, the spontaneity, income levels, and then also the marketing channels. Um, we start to work with you know banks, and they they added kind of like flyers to their um, credit card statements for like the black card holders, so you know that these people are maybe more wealthy or they have higher mm -hmm. spending because they like you know they have the, the higher tier in, in certain credit card, and so you can adjust a little bit in terms of the audience, the product, but then also you need to create features that that just makes it more expensive in a way for for users to use the service, and so you can upsell a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, just like try to uh, monetize um, the users more. All right. Um, moving on to the other hat that you wear as a venture capitalist, uh, you are a part of uh, the Swiss Founders Fund. And uh, I remember in one conversation you mentioned about the seasonality in the, the, the VC climate and the VC world, which is a founder's market and sometimes uh, an investor's market. Could you just share the dynamics which which are there, the thought process behind that? Sure, yeah, it's it's all goes in cycles, and okay. um, so in, in crypto, for instance, you know, it's it's normally a four year cycle, and it's okay. it's very kind of like um, easy to predict because uh, you know there's, there's halvings, Bitcoin, etc. So it's mm -hmm. like a cycle there. But the same happens also in in Web two and tech in general, and it's very dependent also on kind of like the macroeconomic environment, uh, which is. Normally, the lower the interest rates, the more investments go into alternative investments. It's cheaper, basically, to, to raise capital, to leverage, you know, take up debt, etc. So it's like, there's normally the lower the interest rates, the more kind of like free capital, and capital needs to be allocated. Uh, it's normally good for equities, it's not so good for bonds. And so often in that case, you know, it's easier for venture capitalists to raise another fund because it's an alternative investment. Right. Um, which re you know, supposedly to return better than you know if you invest into kind of like capital market where yes. you get like half a percent or like not even you know on, on you know for long term kind of like bonds. Um, so then in such an environment in low interest rate environments which we had you know for a very long time between kind of like you know the great financial crisis in two thousand eight two thousand nine up until kind of like the end of twenty twenty one there was a very low interest rate environment and and so that helped VCs to raise funds from institutional investors that were kind of like chasing higher yields, which they couldn't find on kind of like public markets or capital markets. And so these funds, normally they have a life cycle of say seven, eight years, and then maybe one or two years that they could extend, but they need to deploy. So normally it's like a deployment period of a fund. When they raise a new fund, they have say three years to deploy the capital. And then the remaining kind of like, you know, life of the fund is just to either do follow on investments and then after you know these seven, eight, nine years, they should try to close the fund and then return the capital to their LPs. Or mm -hmm. normally what they do, they just like, you know, add another fund and convince their LPs to not, you know, take the money back and just put it into the next fund. And, and so the funds get bigger and bigger. And so um, we had such a long period where it was easy for VCs to raise capital. And then there was this, in a way, deployment pressure also by these VCs to actually spend, you know, the money. Normally, uh, you know, this innovation is fairly linear. You know, you okay. always have kind of like spikes. And right now, you know, it's kind of like the AI spike. You know, there's like so much happening in AI right now. Um, there were like spikes in fintech. There was like micromobility. There was quick commerce. There was like, there's always certain hypes where, you know, either there's really innovation there, which is like copy of the same models in, in different geographies, but there's investable kind of like companies. But it's more linear. Whereas like for, for funds, you know, the funds get bigger and bigger and they have deployment pressure. So you have more capital chasing the same amount of, of companies, basically. And so for in such an environment, it's good for investors and it's easier to raise money because, you know, it's, um, you know, new ideas uh, can also get funded that, that maybe in a, in a different environment would not get funding. And it's also easier to have a higher valuation and to raise more money because gotcha. as a founder, yeah. you normally want to want to cap kind of like the dilution that you accept. And so, you know, this is for the past, 11 years like uh, you know, okay. so between like tw you know, 2010 to 2021 it was yeah. great you know for for found founders 2016 was a little bit of a dip because of you know the the fund cycles coming to mm -hmm. end and new funds coming um but apart from that it was was a great bull run for any founder 
Now things have changed. Now interest rates have gone up. Um, so all the funds, there's also like one of like some of these monster funds, they actually return the money back to the LPs because they don't, don't want to kind of like have a bad fund performance and then not be able to raise the next fund. So they basically return the money to LPs. So some of these billion dollar funds, they gave the money back to the to the LPs and they make the, the fund smaller because they also realize, okay, it's, it's not that much to invest anymore. All these fintechs and quick commerce and, and all of these companies, they're about to go bust because people also have them that much uh, disposable income anymore. Right. They don't spend on, on like, you know, things that they don't need because they see like, you know, their savings are being evaporated through through uh, inflation and, and all of these kind of worries that people have. And so the climate is very different right now. And right now it's very hard, very much the opposite of what it was two years ago. Okay. Now it's very hard to raise money as a founder. And so as an investor, it's great. So now, you know, the investors are really scared. You know, they miss out on great deals right now. And yeah. so, you know, the funds that are still out there and deploying capital, I think they will do well, you know, over the next uh, few years because now you can actually really negotiate good terms and as, a, as an investor, mm -hmm. now's the time to invest. And it's surprising how many funds are very cyclical and they all have FOMO in like 2021. Mm -hmm. like, you know, they, they invest like 100 million into like a company that's completely overvalued and, and they just <laughs> want to be part of it, like Clubhouse. So like right. you know, even Andreessen Horowitz, yes. like they, they were lead, leading four rounds of Clubhouse and, and it was just FOMO, you know, thinking, okay, this is going to go to the moon and, and they can exit it before, you know, there's, there's a drawdown. But, but yeah, it's still private and, and the drawdown came. And so the best investor kind of like move anti-cyclical and they kind of get cautious when others get greedy and, you know, don't participate in, in oversubscribed rounds at like crazy valuation or at uncapped saves so or like all of these crazy things and just wait it out a little bit and, and the storm will brush over and, and then for sure there's going to be a bear market again. And then it's the time to invest because then you can actually really take your time to do with your diligence, talk to the founders, look at everything and then... If you really feel like okay this is a good business then yeah you negotiate good terms and and again and this business will do well because you know they raise money during the bear market and when the bull market is coming back they you know, only do, do it well it's only northwards yeah. but it's all about opportunities as well and yeah. and i think as a as an investor you also need to be opportunistic as as much as as a founder you need to be opportunistic as well and uh you know opportunities come and go and, and it's all about sort of the deal flow as well I think uh, you know we've managed to kind of like build our own deal flow with Swiss Founders Fund yeah. uh, because we're operators ourselves, and so we know kind of like founders and we see founders how they operate, and, and so it's we kind of have like our proprietary you know um, investment uh, deal flow, and it's also we don't have deployment pressure because it's our own money that we invest. It's not yes. actually we don't have outside investors behind us, and so you know we can we can wait it out. We don't have deployment pressure. So in 2021 we we didn't have to invest. We still invest, but we didn't have to. And now we can still invest because you know it's our own money, and, and so we can invest and, and really find good deals. Mm -hmm. So, so in terms of you know, if we flip the script now, we're looking at you from a VC point of view. What are maybe the top three things that you look for in the startups that you invest in, or their founders? So we normally invest in pre-seed and seed stage um, as sort of first investment. We normally kind of like follow on thereafter, but as a first uh, entry point, it's like as early as possible, and we're also okay to be like the first check into a team and and hence like for us it's really important to to vet the people you know the people that like do we have a good feeling you know mm -hmm. with that person you know do we think like that person is has a high degree of integrity you know in terms of you know following through with like you know what they kind of like promise like is that track record you know mm -hmm. any anything that you know we would say like yeah okay this is not something easy does the, the person has the person shown in the past that they go the extra mile you know that they don't give up uh, when when the going gets tough, um, you know. And then the business, we wouldn't invest into something that we don't understand. So right. you know, we've been pitched a lot of, you know, biotechs and and like you know, medtech and these kind maybe. of things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're like, you know, we a we can't help, you know, because we don't know anything about this mm -hmm. space. And if we don't really understand it, then it's also like we're not we're not you know good investors because we can't really due diligence it properly. But if it's say something, it's like a SaaS business, whether it's B two B or B two C, or it's a marketplace, or like it's maybe a marketplace uh, you know here from the region, but they have plans to expand to Asia thereafter, or it's it's maybe you know something adjacent to hospitality or prop tech or something like that, where you know we feel like we have a very deep understanding of the industry and we've built marketplace ourselves, then you know it's something that you know is more interesting to us, and we feel like we can just contribute more also to then you know the the team. And complement in a, way, in a way with our experience and just give them some you know help along the way in addition to just like finance the company 
it's in a way almost like an insurance, you know, like mm -hmm. we make an investment, but then we also can like contribute our experience and our network and, and like help them maybe be more successful um, than just if we invest into something where if you like, you know, this just like, you know, fire and forget uh, yeah. type of investment. And so that's not, not a preferred mode. So we try to find teams that are, that have all of these kind of like things. Normally we invest into teams, not single, like solo founders. Mm -hmm. um, there's some exceptions, but but preferably also more tech heavy rather than business heavy. Okay. Um, but that's just like kind of like a personal preference as well. Also to talk about your other venture, which is also here in, in the UAE, Guess Ready. Um, there is this business old age saying that expansion through product or through geography is the only way to go forward. And I believe Guess Ready has some history in acquiring startups in, in different part of parts of the world. So is there a basic rule of thumb that you look at when acquiring startups and, or to expand uh, fast if it's in line with the, the philosophy of, of what Guest Ready is doing? Yeah, so Guest Ready um, is now the leading short-term rental management company in Europe and, and the Middle East. Um, focused on kind of like urban destinations. So we're in, in like Paris, London, Dubai, you know, Portugal, uh, Lisbon, Porto. So in different kind of like uh, metropolitan areas. And the nature of the business is just so that like many people can start this business. You know, anybody can basically start to host on Airbnb, mm -hmm. can take the neighbor's apartment, the girlfriend's apartment, the cousin's apartment, and, and suddenly you're like a little property manager. And so there's countless little property managers out there mm -hmm. that have managed to also scale it up, you know, and sometimes decently to like, you know, 50, 100 properties. And you know, it's an intense business, and particularly once you start to manage more than 10 properties, you'll, you'll realize, oh, this is not, it's not easy to run a business successfully yes. because it's very operationally intense. And so some of these founders, um, they've never taken outside investment, but they kind of like hit the glass ceiling. They hit, like, they get to work 50 to 100 properties under management. They have a small team. They just manage, you know, to manage it, but they're getting worn out. They're getting mm -hmm. kind of like tired of like running this business 24 seven, like whenever like everybody else is on holidays, it's your busiest time. Right? And, and so it's like, it's a very intense business to run. And some of them, they're still very proud of like what they've built, but they also feel like, okay, it's maybe time to pass it on to somebody else. Right. And either to raise funding, which they've never done before. And many of them are not tech founders. They're, they're property managers essentially. Um, but they still care very much about their properties, their, the property owners, the hosts as well as their sure. team. And so yeah. they prefer to kind of like give it on to somebody else. And these are the type of kind of companies that we, uh, you know, we've acquired in the past where you have a strong founder, they know exactly what they're doing operationally, but they just like to take kind of like a step back and say like, okay, now I, I prefer to be part of something bigger. I don't have to worry about like raising funds. I can join kind of like the market leader. They have great technology, you know, guest ready, um, great processes, a back office and all of that stuff. And I can just like benefit kind of like of that infrastructure that Gastrade has, has built. And so with that, uh, you know, we've managed to consolidate a very fragmented market you know, a little bit. And yeah. they keep on, on doing that because there's just so many small uh, property managers that we can acquire and integrate into Gastrade. Incredible. So actually what I wanted to ask about was your, um, your latest venture, Deskimo, being um, headquartered in Singapore, but you're, you're bringing it over here to the Middle East. What is it in terms of regions that you're that you look for when setting up a new region, and why why does UAE tick those boxes, and why do you think Deskimo would be actually quite suitable for us out here in the Middle East? So Deskimo is a platform marketplace again, and you know we've built a lot of marketplaces so we can have like that marketplace experience. Yes, and we basically um, offer a no membership model to access co-working spaces. So it's on-demand access to co-working spaces, the likes of. You know, we work regions, spaces like uh, you know, these guys. Um, we also have like some really, really nice coworking spaces here. Um, you know, already signed up. We have like you know Unbox, uh, which is close by here. We have yes. Milk. We have uh, Surf Corp as well signed up, um, and some others. So uh, it's it's a nice product basically for anyone who's working hybrid or remote. And there's more and more people, particularly also here in the region, that you know spend a few months, uh, maybe in, during European winter, they they spend like you know their winter months here where it's warm. Um, or a lot of people also locally, they work hybrid because maybe their office, the corporate office is in Marina, but they live in downtown or the other way around. And they don't want to commute uh, every day and, and, you know, be stuck in traffic jam. And so they prefer to work like, you know, two or three days a week from home. And not everybody has a great home office, right? So it's, uh, yes. it's good to have kind of like near home office space. 
And because we have like a range of different workspaces, there should be like a workspace is near home to anybody. And Very so it's much. a B2B2C model. So it's a, we sign up companies and these companies then give a budget to their employees so that these employees, they can use you know, any of these co-working spaces if they want to and need to. If they don't, it doesn't cost the company anything. But if they do, then it's clearly a benefit to their employees. And, and so it's, it's a great kind of like employee benefit for hybrid, the hybrid workflows. I think after COVID, everybody kind of went home and then it was a struggle to get people back into offices. But mm. then there was a dip in terms of performance, perhaps because, yeah, people like to work at home. Change in habit. Yeah, it can feel a bit monotonous and a bit mundane when you're in the same room and perhaps you're not seeing enough sunlight or getting out right. and mm. mixing with people. Mm. So I think this is a nice hybrid model. And it's great that you're offering, offering companies a great way to just sort of Hey, I know you don't want to come into the office, but maybe go into someone's <laughs> office. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so, you know, we feel like, you know, Dubai is, is a great hub for that. There's a lot of also freelancers, there's people that work remotely, um, you know, also from the US or, or Europe where they can work remote. And yes. maybe their employers uh, think they're still, you know, somewhere in the UK, but they're actually, you know, hanging out in Dubai. Uh, they just work UK, UK time zone. And, but they need a, like a professional work environment, like the background, the Zoom calls, like, you know, steady internet, like, all of these kind of things. Um, but then, so we felt like Dubai is a great place and because it's a marketplace and the same learning as for, from Food Panda, if you have a more expensive place and because we take a commission, it's just more attractive for us as well. And Dubai is, you know, an expensive place, similar to like Hong Kong, Singapore. And so it's, it's more profitable in a way for us as well to actually run this business here right. than in Indonesia, where we also, but in Indonesia, you know, you have like 300 million people. Mm -hmm. So it's still it's still an interesting market for us because there's volume. Um, but if there's no volume, then at least, you know, the hourly rate in a way should be high enough so that the commission for us is also high enough. So one unique feature about Deskimo is that you can actually stay there by the minute, which is uh, a very important pool or very USP that people over here haven't been exposed to. And I think so that's a great pool that this this app has over, over the other ones out here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's really... Um, cost efficient and and we really focus on kind of like bringing as much value as possible to the users and to the companies rather than just overcharging them for like a day pass uh, even though people might only go to like the office for like two or three hours and, yeah. so chris where can they learn more about deskimo uh so you know on the internet deskimo.com um you can just uh, explore um, also if you have a company office or you're running a company you can learn more more about uh, how we can empower your your workforce um, or you can just download the uh, Deskimo app from the App Store, whether it's for iOS or for Android. If you uh, enter the voucher code CHRIS50, uh, you get 50 dirham off uh, your first uh, visit. And so no strings attached. Uh, you can just try it out. doesn't cost you anything. If you like it, you know, keep on using it. And, uh, and we really hope that we can provide value to you. Awesome. I'll be using that for sure. Yeah, looking forward to be a super user of Deskimo now. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to seeing what you do with Deskimo. And if it's anything like your track record, it will be exploding in no time. So <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll see. Thanks for coming on. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for having me. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in to this podcast. We look forward to having you on more such podcasts where we'll have inspiring entrepreneurs talking about their journey. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the follow button and share it with anybody you think it would bring value to. Until then, Sandpit Startups. <laughs>